Welcome back. In this video, we're going to be looking at some examples of work problems that we can solve with calculus. Let's get to it. All right, so here's our first example. Our first two examples actually aren't going to include any calculus. I just want to review some basic scenarios where we can calculate work where we have a constant force. And so first we have determine the work done in lifting a bag of cat litter that weighs 35 pounds to a height of 10 feet off the ground. All right, and so the basic formula that you need to know for calculating work is that work is equal to force times displacement. And remember, as a concept, work is the energy transferred to or from an object by a force along a displacement. And so work is equal to force times displacement. And so in this specific problem, we wanna calculate the work done in lifting a bag of cat litter. Now this bag of cat litter weighs 35 pounds and that is going to be our force, right? Pounds is a unit of weight that already accounts for the effects of gravity, so weight is a force, and so our force in this case will be equal to 35 pounds. And then for our displacement, we want to lift this bag of cat litter 10 feet off the ground, and so the displacement will be equal to 10 feet. And so if we plug these values into our work equation, we will have that the work is equal to 35 pounds times 10 feet, and that will be equal to 350 foot-pounds. And foot-pounds is a unit of work when we are using the US customary unit system. And so for this problem, 350 foot-pounds is the work required to lift a bag of cat litter weighing 35 pounds to a height of 10 feet off the ground. All right, let's look at another example of a constant force problem, and then we'll start looking at variable force problems where we wanna calculate work by using calculus. So here's our second example where the force is constant. We wanna determine the work done in pushing a truck a distance of 20 meters with a constant force of 300 newtons. Now in this case, we're working with the metric system because we're pushing our truck a distance of 20 meters and our force is measured in newtons, not pounds. All right, but we're gonna use the same formula for work. We know that work is equal to force times displacement, and in this case, our force is a constant force of 300 newtons, and that force of 300 newtons is used to push a truck a distance of 20 meters. And so the displacement is equal to 20 meters. And so if we plug each of these values into our equation for work, we will have that the work is equal to 300 newtons times 20 meters, and that will be equal to 6,000 newton meters. And so while you could leave the units as newton meters, we could also rewrite newton meters to be the unit of work for the metric system, which is joules. And so this will be equal to 6,000 joules. And a joule is the same as a newton meter. All right, and so 6,000 joules is the work done by pushing a truck a distance of 20 meters with a constant force of 300 newtons. All right, so this was the last work problem with a constant force. From here on out, we're going to be looking at variable forces when determining work, and so we are going to need to use calculus, specifically a definite integral, to solve the rest of these problems. All right, so first up, we're gonna be looking at some spring problems, and these problems involve calculating the work done in stretching or compressing a spring. And so for this example, we have that a spring has a natural length of three feet. An object of 10 pounds hanging on the spring stretches it to a total of 3.5 feet. And then we have three parts that we wanna answer. And so for part A, we wanna find the spring constant in pounds per foot. For part B, we wanna know how far beyond its natural length would an object of 50 pounds stretch the spring. And then for part C, how much work is required to stretch the spring from its natural length to a length of four feet. All right, so let's take this part by part. Let's start with part A. We wanna find the spring constant for the spring in this problem. And when you're working with spring problems, you need to remember that the force on the spring will be equal to the spring constant times the displacement of the spring, right? And that displacement is the measurement from the natural length of the spring to the distance that it has either been stretched or the distance that it has been compressed. And so in order to find this spring constant K, we're going to need to use the information given to us in our problem. We are told that a spring has a natural length of three feet 
and that an object of 10 pounds hanging on the spring stretches it to a total of 3.5 feet. All right, so our force in this case is this 10 pounds hanging on the spring. So we're gonna have 10 pounds is equal to the spring constant times the displacement. Now in this case, that 10 pound force stretches this spring from a natural length of three feet to a length of 3.5 feet. So the displacement is the distance of that stretch. And so if the natural length is three and we stretched it to 3.5, then 0.5 feet is the displacement. All right, so X is going to be 0.5 feet. And so now we can solve for our spring constant by dividing both sides by 0.5 feet. And if we do that, we'll find that K, the spring constant, is equal to 10 divided by 0.5. That is equal to 20, so we will have 20 pounds per foot, right? Since we are dividing pounds by feet, our units are going to be pounds divided by feet or pounds per foot. All right, and so that's part A. We found that the spring constant is equal to 20 pounds per foot. All right, but then how about part B? We want to know how far beyond its natural length would an object of 50 pounds stretch the spring? All right, well, we can use that same equation that the force is equal to the spring constant times the displacement, and we can find out what that displacement would be. In this case, our force is going to be 50 pounds, and so 50 will be equal to the spring constant, which is 20 pounds per foot, so we will have 20 times x. And so if we solve for x in this equation, that will tell us the distance or how far beyond the natural length this object of 50 pounds would stretch our spring. And remember that the units here for 50 is pounds and a unit for 20 is pounds per foot. So if we divide 50 pounds by 20 pounds per foot, we're gonna be left with a distance in feet. And so 50 divided by 20 will give us that x is equal to five halves, and that is measured in feet. And five halves is equal to 2.5, and so x is equal to 2.5 feet, which is going to be our final answer for part b. If we have this spring with a spring constant of 20 pounds per foot, then an object of 50 pounds will stretch that spring 2.5 feet. Okay, and so that's part b. The answer was x equals 2.5 feet, and now we can move on to part C, which is where the calculus is going to come into play. And so let me clean up my work here. Now we want to know how much work is required to stretch the spring from its natural length to a length of four feet. Okay, so now we are calculating the work in this problem. And when you want to calculate work for a variable force, which is going to be the case for all the rest of these example problems, you need to use the following formula, that the work is equal to the integral from A to B of the force function, capital F of X, times DX. And in this case, since we are working with a spring, the force function will be equal to the spring constant times X. And so we already know what the spring constant is equal to. We found that in part A. And so if we replace K with 20, then we know that our force function is equal to 20 times X, okay? And so that's going to be our function for our integral. But then what about our bounds of integration? Well, that's going to depend on how far we want to stretch or compress our spring. And in this case, we want to find the work required to stretch the spring from its natural length to a length of four feet. Now, the natural length of this spring is three feet. Remember, our problem tells us that. The spring has a natural length of three feet. And so it might be tempting to say that the bounds of integration should be from three to four. However, that is not correct. When you set up your bounds of integration, you are looking for the displacement from the natural length to however far you want to stretch it. So in this case, we are going from the natural length of three to a total length of four feet. So the difference between three feet and four feet is just one foot, right? We're only stretching this spring one foot. So our bounds of integration are just going to be from zero to one. We're starting at the spring's natural length, and so the displacement is zero, so that's our bottom bound, and we wanna stretch it one foot further than its natural length, and so the upper bound is one. Okay, so that's how we determine the bounds of integration. And so now we can plug in our force function, which is 20x, so we will have 20x times dx. And now we have a fairly simple integral that we can solve. And so if we integrate, this will be equal 
to 20 times x squared divided by 2 evaluated from 0 to 1, right? If we use the power rule of integration, we add 1 to the exponent and then divide by that new exponent. So we have x squared divided by 2. And so now we can evaluate this expression at 1 and subtract the evaluation at 0. But notice that plugging 0 into this expression is just going to produce 0 right, zero squared times 20 is just equal to zero and divided by two is still zero. And so we only need to plug in one, but first note that 20 divided by two is equal to 10. So this is equal to 10 times x squared evaluated from zero to one. And so now if we plug in one, this is equal to 10 times one squared, which is equal to 10, but then we can't forget our units. Since we are working in terms of feet and pounds, then that means that our unit of work will be foot pounds. And so 10 foot-pounds is the work required to stretch the spring in this problem from its natural length to a length of 4 feet. All right, and so we have completed part C, which means that we have finished this entire example. Let's look at another example. So here we have another spring problem. This time we have if the work required to stretch a spring 1 foot beyond its natural length is 15 foot-pounds, how much work is needed to stretch it 8 inches beyond its natural length? All right, so right off the bat, we're told that the work required to stretch a spring one foot beyond its natural length is 15 foot-pounds. And so remember the formula for work is that work is equal to the integral from a to b of the force function times dx. And in this case, the force function will be equal to the spring constant times x. And so we were initially told that it takes 15 foot-pounds to stretch the spring in this problem one foot beyond its natural length. And so w is the work, so we'll have 15 is equal to the integral from zero to one of the spring constant times x times dx, right? If we are stretching a spring one foot beyond its natural length, then our bounds of integration will be from zero to one. One foot is the displacement between the natural length of the spring and how far we want to stretch it. And so now we have an integral here that we will be able to use to solve for our spring constant that we can then use to answer our question, which is how much work is needed to stretch it eight inches beyond its natural length. In order to find that work, we are going to need to know this force function, including that spring constant. And so setting up this definite integral with that previous information will allow us to solve for that spring constant. All we have to do is integrate this and solve for k. And so if I pull k to the outside, remember that k is just a constant, it's not a variable, and so we can pull it outside of the integral. And so we'll have 15 is equal to k times the integral from zero to one of x times dx. Now if we integrate x, we'll add one to the exponent and then divide by that new exponent. And so then we will have that 15 is equal to k times x squared divided by two evaluated from zero to one. And then if we evaluate this expression at one and then subtract the evaluation at zero, we will have 15 is equal to k times one squared divided by two minus zero, right? Zero squared divided by two will be zero. And so then we will have 15 is equal to k times one half. And if we divide both sides by one half, then we will find that k is equal to 30. And so now we have that our spring constant is equal to 30 which means that our force function will be equal to 30 times x. All right, and so if I clean up my work here, we can now use this force function to determine the work needed to stretch this spring eight inches beyond its natural length. And so now we'll have that the work is equal to the integral of that function, 30x times dx. But what will our bounds of integration be? Well, we're stretching our spring eight inches beyond its natural length. And so if we're starting at the natural length, the lower bound will be zero, but then the upper bound will be eight inches. But remember, we need to be working in terms of feet so that we can calculate the work in foot pounds. Okay, this spring constant right here is in pounds per feet because in that previous integral, our work was 15 foot pounds and our bounds of integration was from zero to one foot. So we need to continue working in feet. And so we need to convert eight inches into feet. And so if we have eight inches, remember that there are 12 inches in one foot. So for one foot, there are 12 inches. And so if we multiply eight by 1 12th, the inches will cancel out. And so we'll have eight divided by 12, 
which gives us 8 twelfths, and that reduces to 2 thirds. Okay, so 8 inches is the same as 2 thirds of a foot. So our upper bound of our definite integral will be 2 thirds. All right, and so now we can solve our integral. We can integrate 30x and then evaluate it at our bounds. So this will be equal to 30x squared divided by 2. That's just using the power rule of integration evaluated from 0 to 2 thirds. And then 30 divided by 2 is 15. So this is equal to 15x squared evaluated from 0 to 2 thirds. And then if we plug in 2 thirds and subtract plugging in 0, this is equal to 15 times 2 thirds squared minus 0 because 0 squared times 15 is 0. So we don't really need to write that. And then 2 thirds squared is going to be 4 ninths. So this is equal to 15 times 4 ninths. And then 15 times 4 is 60. And so we'll have that this is equal to 60 ninths, which we can then reduce by a factor of 3 in the numerator and the denominator. And we will have that this is equal to 20 thirds. And of course, that is measured in foot pounds since we are working in terms of feet and pounds. And so I'll write that. This is 20 thirds and it's measured in foot pounds. And so that is the work required to stretch this spring in this problem eight inches beyond its natural length. Okay, let's look at a different example. So next we're going to look at a propulsion problem, which is another type of work problem. And so let's read what we have here. A particular astronaut weighs 180 pounds on Earth's surface. How much work is done in lifting the astronaut 20 miles from the surface of the moon? The radius of the moon is 1,100 miles, and its force of gravity is one-sixth that of Earth. All right, and so the way you can identify this as a propulsion problem is propulsion problems deal with lifting objects, or in this case, an astronaut, from the surface of a planet or a giant mass into space. And so the force equation that we're going to use for propulsion problems is derived from Newton's law of universal gravitation. And that law says that the weight of a body varies inversely as the square of its distance from the center of that mass with a gravitational pull. So the force exerted by gravity is equal to a constant of proportionality between the masses divided by x squared, where x is the distance to the center of the mass. Or you could also view it as the radius of that mass. And so if we're going to find the work done in lifting the astronaut in this problem, we're still going to use the formula that work is equal to the integral from a to b of a force function times dx. But in this case, the force function will be equal to that constant of proportionality c divided by x squared. But similar to our spring problems, we need to figure out what this constant is equal to, just like the spring constant, before we can use this force equation in our definite integral. And so we have to use some information that we know from our problem to solve for that value of c. And so in this case, the force is going to be the weight of our astronaut on the surface that he is being lifted from. And so in this case, we're told that the astronaut weighs 180 pounds on Earth's surface. All right, so we might want to set our force equal to 180, except we are lifting the astronaut 20 miles from the surface of the moon. So he doesn't weigh 180 pounds on the moon because we're told that the force of gravity is one sixth that of Earth on the moon. And so instead of weighing 180 pounds on the moon, the astronaut is going to weigh one sixth of that 180 pounds. And so 180 divided by six is equal to 30. And so our astronaut will actually weigh 30 pounds on the moon and so that is going to be the force that we will use in our equation to solve for the constant of proportionality. We'll have 30 is equal to C divided by X squared, where X squared is going to be the radius of our mass squared. And in this case, our mass will be the moon, and we're told that the radius of the moon is 1,100 miles. And so we will have 1,100 squared. Okay, and so if I clean up my work here, we can solve for C by first squaring 1,100 and then multiplying both sides by that value. And so we'll have 30 is equal to C divided by 1,100 squared, which is 1,210,000. And so if we multiply both sides by that value, we will find that C, the constant of proportionality, is equal to 
300,000. Okay, and so that is the value of C. And so if we plug that into our force function, we will have that the force function is equal to 36,300,000 divided by x squared. All right, and so we can use that for our definite integral. All we need to figure out now are the bounds of integration. And so our bounds are going to be related to the distance that our astronaut needs to travel. The lower bound will be where the astronaut starts, and the upper bound is where the astronaut will be lifted to. And so if you imagine that this is the moon, and this is our astronaut, the distance from the center of the moon to the surface is the radius, and that is 1,100 miles. And so our lower bound is equal to the starting point of the astronaut with relation to the center of the mass. And so the astronaut starts at a distance of 1,100 miles from the center of the mass, and he's going to be lifted 20 miles from the surface of the moon. And so he's going to be lifted to a distance of 1,120 miles. And so that is going to be our upper bound. All right, so the astronaut starts at a distance of 1,100 miles from the center of the mass, or in this case, the moon, and he's being lifted an extra 20 miles into space. Okay, and so our integral will look like this. The work is equal to the integral from 1,100 to 1,120 of the force function, which is 36,300,000 divided by x squared times dx. All right, and so if I clean up my work here, we can now solve this definite integral and find the work done in propelling that astronaut 20 miles from the surface of the moon. And so if I rewrite this integral by moving x squared to the numerator by making the exponent negative, we'll have that this is equal to the integral from 1,100 to 1,120 of 36,300,000 times x to the negative second power times dx. And now we can more easily see how we're going to use the power rule of integration to integrate this term. So this will be equal to 36,300,000 times the integral of x to the negative second power, which if we add one to the exponent and divide by that new exponent, we will have x to the negative first power divided by negative one, and that will be evaluated from 1,100 to 1,120. And so if we move this x to the denominator, that negative first power will become a positive power of one. And then we could just move this negative to the top because dividing by negative one and multiplying by negative one basically do the same thing. And so we can rewrite x to the negative first power divided by negative one to be negative one divided by x to the positive first power. So just x in the denominator. Okay, and so then we can evaluate this expression at each of these bounds. And so if I continue my work up here, we'll have that this is equal to 36,300,000 times negative one divided by 1,120 minus negative one divided by 1,100. All right, so we just plugged our upper bound into this expression to get this term and then subtracted plugging in the lower bound into that expression, which is where this comes from. All right, and so if we simplify, these two negatives will become positive, and so we will have negative one divided by 1,120 plus one divided by 1,100. And if you add these two fractions together in a calculator, you'll find that this is equal to 36,300,000 times one divided by 61,600. And so if you multiply that fraction by 36,300,000, the work will be equal to 4,125 divided by seven, and the units, since we are working with miles and pounds, will be mile pounds. And so that would be our answer in mile pounds, but typically we don't use mile pounds, we'd rather use foot pounds, and so we can convert this to foot pounds by remembering that there are 5,280 feet in one mile. And so if we multiply by that, the mile units will cancel out, and then 4,125 times 5,280 will give us that the work done in foot-pounds is equal to 21,780,000 divided by seven, and that is foot-pounds. Okay, and so that is the work done in lifting an astronaut 20 miles from the surface of the moon. 
And by the way, if you plug this fraction into your calculator, it is approximately equal to 3,111,428.6 foot pounds. And so I'll just write that over here in case you're interested in seeing that, but the approximate value would be 3,111,428.6 foot pounds. All right, so these answers are the same. It's up to you how you want to express that answer, but either way, that is the work done in this problem. So next we're going to look at some lifting problems, which is another type of work problem. In this case, we will be calculating the work done in lifting an object that has a variable force. And so let's read this example. We have a bag of sand originally weighing 144 pounds is lifted at a constant rate. As it rises, sand also leaks out at a constant rate. At the instant when the bag has been lifted to a height of 18 feet, exactly half of the original amount of sand remains. Calculate the work done in lifting the sand to the height of 18 feet from the ground. All right, so let's start by drawing a picture of what's happening here. First, I'll draw our bag of sand. That's going to be sand, and we want to lift that from a height of zero to a height of 18. So that's 18 feet, and this is zero feet. All right, but we are told that as we lift that bag, sand is leaking out of the bag at a constant rate. And so because of that, once the bag is lifted to 18 feet, half of the original amount of sand remains. And so that means when this bag reaches 18 feet, it will weigh half the amount that it weighed at the start. And so we're told that the bag of sand originally weighs 144 pounds, right? So at zero feet, the bag of sand weighs 144 pounds. But at 18 feet, it's going to weigh half of that. So 144 pounds divided by two will be equal to 72 pounds. And so since the weight of the bag is not going to be the same for the entirety of the lift, we have a variable force, and so we're going to need to calculate this work done by using a definite integral. Okay, but before we can set up that definite integral, we need to find a way to represent the force function for this problem. How are we going to represent the variable force as a function? Well, what we should find is some kind of rate that tells us how the weight is decreasing. So if we lost half of our sand, we went from 144 pounds to 72 pounds, then that means that we lost 72 pounds over the course of 18 feet, right? So we lost 72 pounds over 18 feet. And so if we divide 72 pounds by 18 feet, that is equal to four pounds per foot. And so that tells us that our bag of sand is losing four pounds for every foot that it rises. All right, and so our force function, capital F of X, will be equal to the initial weight of the bag, since that is a force, 144, but we wanna subtract four pounds per foot, and we can represent each foot with X. Okay, and so now since we have our force function, we can set up our integral to calculate the work in this scenario. And so if I clean up my work here, we know that the work will be equal to the integral from a to b of the force function times dx. Now we have our force function, but what will our bounds of integration be? Well, the displacement of our bag is going to be 18 feet, right? We're starting at zero feet and we're lifting it to a height of 18 feet. And so our bounds of integration will be from zero to 18. And so the work will be equal to the integral from zero to 18 of the force function 144 minus 4x times dx. All right, and so now we can solve for the work by evaluating this integral. And so if I clean up my work, we can integrate each of these terms and we will have that this is equal to 144x minus 4x squared divided by two evaluated from zero to 18, right? The integral of a constant is that constant times the variable of integration. So we have 144 times x, and then we use the power rule of integration for 4x by adding one to the exponent and then dividing by that new exponent. And so four divided by two is two. So we can rewrite this to be two x squared, and then we can evaluate this expression at 18 and subtract the evaluation at zero. But note that plugging zero into x here is just going to produce zero. 
144 times 0 is 0, minus 2 times 0 squared is still 0, and so we really only need to plug in 18 into this expression. And so this will be equal to 144 times 18 minus 2 times 18 squared, and then if you wanted to write it down, minus 0. All right, but that's really not necessary, and so I'm just going to erase that, and we can continue our work up here. That will be equal to 144 times 18, which is 2,592, and then we will subtract 2 times 18 squared, and 18 squared is 324, so we have 2 times 324, and 2 times 324 is 648, so this is equal to 2,592 minus 648, and so this will be equal to 1,944. And the units are going to be foot-pounds because we're working with feet and pounds. All right, so I will write foot-pounds, okay? And so 1,944 foot-pounds is the work done in lifting the bag of sand 18 feet when it loses half of its weight during that lift. All right, so here's our next example. We have another lifting problem. This time we have a five pound bucket containing 10 pounds of water is hanging at the end of a 30 foot rope, which weighs one half pound per foot. The other end of the rope is attached to a pulley. Find the work done in winding the rope onto the pulley. All right, so once again, let's draw a picture of what we're working with here. It'll give us a better understanding of our scenario. So we know we have a bucket of water. So I'm gonna draw the bucket first. That's going to be our bucket of water. And I'll shade it in with blue so we know that it is holding water. And then that bucket is hanging at the end of a rope. So I'm gonna draw the rope here. And that rope is attached to a pulley that is going to lift the rope and the bucket. And so if I draw a little platform here for the pulley, you can now sort of see the scenario that we are working with here. Okay, and so we're told that this rope is 30 feet long. So I'll label that, the rope is 30 feet long. And our bucket weighs five pounds and it contains 10 pounds of water. So together, the bucket and the water weigh a total of 15 pounds. So this bucket is 15 pounds in weight. All right, and then we also know that the rope weighs one half pound per foot. So the weight here is one half pound per foot. And that's really all the information we've been given here, other than the fact that we are told to find the work done in winding the rope onto the pulley. So we want to wind all of this rope up into the pulley and lift this bucket all the way to the top. And so in order to calculate the work here, we are going to need to use the formula that the work is equal to the integral from A to B of the force function, capital F of X, times dx. And in this case, the force is a variable force because as we pull up more and more of this rope onto the pulley, there's less rope to pull over time, right? As this bucket is pulled up closer and closer to the top because the rope is winding on the pulley, there is less rope being pulled by the pulley. And the rope weighs one half pound per foot. And so that force of the weight is changing as the bucket and the rope are pulled up onto the pulley. All right, and so let's figure out what our force function would be in this case. The force, capital F of X, will be equal to the weight of the bucket plus the weight of the rope. Now the weight of the bucket is constant. That's not going to change throughout this problem because we're not told that the bucket is losing water or that more water is being added to the bucket, right? The bucket and the water remain the same. The bucket is five pounds and the water inside the bucket is 10 pounds. So together, they are 15 pounds and that remains unchanged. So the force function is at least going to be equal to that constant force of 15 pounds, and then we need to add the weight of the rope. And now this is a little bit tricky. As I explained earlier, as the rope is pulled up onto the pulley, there is less and less rope that needs to be lifted. And so it starts out 30 feet long, but it's not going to remain 30 feet long for the entirety of the lifting process. It's going to be less than 30 feet. And so just for a second, let's write down what the force would be on that rope. We know that the force or the weight of that rope is going to be at least one half pound per foot. And so if it remained 30 feet the entire time, we would just multiply one half by 30 and we would have that the weight of the rope is 15 pounds. But that's not the case. We need to adjust that length of 30 feet as the rope gets shorter. And so we can say that as the rope is winding up onto the pulley, 
the rope is going to get shorter by a length of x, right? So we'll multiply one half pounds per foot times the length of the rope, which is going to be 30 minus x, all right? So the minus x represents the amount of the rope that has already been pulled up onto the pulley. And so we're subtracting that amount from the total of 30 feet. And so this will be the force on that rope. The weight of the rope is dependent on how much of it is already on the pulley, okay? And so if this is the weight or the force on the rope, we can add that to the force on the bucket and we'll have 15 plus one half times 30 minus x, okay? And so now we have our force function that we can plug into our work formula. The only thing we need to determine yet are the bounds of integration. What is the displacement of the bucket? Well, the rope is 30 feet long and we wanna find the work done in winding the rope onto the pulley. So I would assume that we are done when the entire rope is on the pulley which means the displacement is going to be 30 feet. That bucket is going to move a total of 30 feet. And so we're starting from a displacement of zero and we will end at a displacement of 30. And so we will have that the work is equal to the integral from zero to 30 of the force function 15 plus one half times 30 minus x times dx. Okay, and so now that we have our definite integral set up, we can now solve it and find the work in this problem. And so if I clean up what I have here, let's simplify what's inside our integral. So this will be equal to the integral from zero to 30 of 15 plus one half times 30 and then one half times negative x. So one half times 30 is 15 and then we will have minus one half times x and that's multiplied by dx. All right, and then 15 plus 15 is equal to 30. So this is equal to the integral from zero to 30 of 30 minus one half x times dx. Okay, and so now we can integrate each of these terms. And so I'll do that up here. This will be equal to 30x minus one half times x squared divided by two. And that will be evaluated from zero to 30, right? So 30 was a constant, so to integrate it, we multiply it by the variable of integration, which is x, so we have 30x, and then we integrate x by adding one to the exponent and dividing by that new exponent, and so we have one half times x squared divided by two. And so if we simplify, this is equal to 30 times x minus x squared divided by four evaluated from zero to 30. And so now if we plug 30 into this expression and then subtract plugging zero in, we will have our final answer for the work. But note that plugging zero in once again is just going to output zero. 30 times zero is zero and zero squared divided by four is zero. So we don't really need to worry about that. Let's just plug in 30. So this will be equal to 30 times 30 minus 30 squared divided by four. And if you wanted to write it down, minus zero, okay? 30 times 30 is 900, so this is equal to 900 minus 30 squared, which is also 900, so 900 divided by four. And 900 divided by four is 225, so I'll erase that, and we will have 225, and 900 minus 225 is 675, and so I'm just gonna rewrite that, and we'll have that this is equal to 675 which is our final answer, except it needs some units. And we were working with feet and pounds in this problem, so that means that our unit will be foot pounds. Okay, and so 675 foot pounds is the work required to wind the rope onto the pulley where that rope is attached to a 15 pound bucket full of water. So next up we have a pumping problem, which is our last type of work problem that we are going to look at. And pumping problems typically work with pumping a fluid such as water in or out of a tank. And so let's read our problem here. We have that a cylindrical tank with a radius of five feet and a height of nine feet is two thirds filled with water. Find the work required to pump all the water over the upper rim of the tank. Or in other words, we're pumping all of the water that's in the tank out of the tank. All right, and so the first thing that we should do here is draw a picture of our tank. And so I'll draw a cylinder here. This is going to represent our tank. And so we know from the problem that the tank has a radius of five feet and a height of nine feet. And so this measurement right here is nine feet. 
And this measurement right here is the radius, which we know to be five feet. Okay, and then we're also told that the tank is two thirds filled with water. And so that means two thirds of the height of the tank is filled with water. And so if we take that height of nine feet and multiply it by two thirds, that will give us 18 divided by three, which is equal to six, which tells us that our tank is filled with water to the six foot mark. And so I'll draw that in. The height of the water is six feet. And then I'll shade that in just so we remember that that is filled up with water to that point. Okay, and so now we've drawn everything that we've been given in this problem. The only other thing that we can label is that we know we want to pump this water out of the tank and we want to calculate the work done by that pumping. And so in order to calculate that work required to pump the water out of the tank, we're going to look at the incremental force on slices of water in the tank. All right, so if we were to look at a small slice of this water, that would be in the shape of a thin disc. And let's say we choose that disc to be a distance of X from the bottom of the tank. We want to look at the incremental force of pumping just that single slice of water out of the tank. And we're going to integrate that for the entire volume of water to find the work done in pumping all of the water out of the tank. And so to do that, we're going to be using a slightly different formula to calculate work. And if you want to see where this formula comes from, be sure to watch my lesson video on work problems where I show you where it comes from. But the formula looks like this. Work is equal to the weight density of the liquid in a tank times the integral from A to B of the cross-sectional area of the slice of water times delta X, the displacement or distance that the water needs to be pumped times DX, the height of the slices. All right, and so in order to set up this work formula, we're going to need to know the weight density of water, the cross-sectional area of a slice of water in the tank, the distance that each slice of water needs to be pumped, and the bounds of integration, or the range for which we can pick a slice between. And this will all make sense as we set it up, but let's start with the weight density. This might be a number that you'll have to memorize if it's not given to you in a problem, but the weight density of water at least in a US customary system, since we're working with feet, I know that we're using US units, is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So the weight density or density times gravity is equal to 62.4. And so I'll start by writing that in. The work will be equal to 62.4 times the integral. And then we'll come back to our bounds of integration. Let's determine the cross-sectional area of a slice of water in the tank. In this case, that cross-sectional area is the area of a circle because the cross-sections of this cylindrical tank are circles. And we know that the area of a circle is equal to pi r squared. And now in this case, the radius of our cross-sections is going to be constant because we have a cylinder where the radius is constant throughout the entire cylinder, right? No matter where we draw a slice within the water, the radius of that circle is going to be the same and it's five feet. So the cross-sectional area will be equal to pi times five squared, and that will be equal to 25 pi. And so the cross-sectional area of a slice of water, no matter where we are in the tank, is 25 pi. So I'll write that into our definite integral. And then next we wanna determine delta x, which is the distance that a slice of water needs to travel to be pumped out of the tank. And so in this case, if we're looking at slices of water, that are a distance of X from the bottom of the tank, then this distance right here is the distance that needs to be traveled to leave the tank. And we know that the entire height of the tank is nine feet. And so that distance will be equal to nine minus X, whatever the height is of the slice of water that we are looking at. So this is nine minus X, which is Delta X. And so we'll write that in our definite integral and multiply the cross-sectional area by nine minus X and then multiply by DX. All right, so we're almost done setting up this definite integral. Now we just need to determine our bounds of integration, which are the range of values that we can choose a slice of water between. Now remember, our water is filled up to the six foot mark within our tank. So we can choose a slice of water or a value of X between zero, the bottom of the tank and the six foot mark of our tank, right? There's no water above the six foot mark and so it doesn't make sense to include values above six. So our bounds of integration will be from zero to six. 
we have a range of six feet of water that we are pumping out of the tank. All right, so now we have our entire definite integral set up for work. So now all we have to do is solve it. And so I'm gonna clean up my work here. We don't need this picture anymore. We just have to solve this integral. Okay, so note that 25 pi is a constant. So we can pull that to the outside. The work will be equal to 62.4 times 25. That's equal to 1,560. And that will still be multiplied by pi. And then that will be multiplied by the integral from zero to six of nine minus x times dx. All right, and so now we can integrate each of these terms. And so this will be equal to 1,560 times pi times the integral of nine will be nine x. It's just a constant, so we multiply it by the variable of integration, minus x squared divided by two, because the integral of x, if we add one to the exponent and then divide by that new exponent, is x squared divided by two via the power rule of integration. And then we're evaluating that from zero to six. Okay, and so now we can plug six into this expression and subtract the evaluation at zero. But note that if we plug zero into x in this expression, we're just going to get zero because nine times zero is zero and zero squared divided by two is also zero. So we're just gonna be subtracting zero. So what we'll have is that this is equal to 1,560 times pi times nine times six minus six squared divided by two minus zero. All right, and so if we simplify, this is equal to 1,560 times pi times nine times six, which is 54, minus six squared divided by two, that will be 36 divided by two, and then 36 divided by two is 18, so I'll just rewrite that, that's 18, and then 54 minus 18 is equal to 36, so this is equal to 1,560 times pi times 36, which is equal to 56,160 times pi, and that is going to be the work done by pumping the water out of the tank. Now in this case, our units will be in foot pounds because we're working with feet and the weight density of water, 62.4, was measured in pounds per cubic foot. So our unit of work here is foot pounds. Okay, and then if you multiplied pi times 56,160, you could have an alternate answer that this is equal to 176,431.84, and that would also be in foot pounds. All right, so either of these answers would be correct, and so that is the work done by pumping the water out of the tank in this example. Let's look at one more example for this video. All right, so here's our last example. We have another pumping problem. And so let's read what we have here. A trough measures 15 feet long and four feet wide at the top. The ends of the trough are isosceles triangles with a height of three feet. If the trough is filled to a height of one foot with water, find the work required to pump all the water over the top of the trough. All right, and so just like with our previous pumping problem, let's start by drawing a picture of our tank. So in this case, we have a trough where the ends are isosceles triangles. And so that will look something like this. And then if we connect those ends, we can form the shape of our trough here. All right, and so then we're told that the trough measures 15 feet long and four feet wide at the top. So at the top of our trough here, this distance is 15 feet, and this distance is four feet. All right, and then additionally, we know that the ends of the trough are isosceles triangles with a height of three. So this distance right here would be the height of the isosceles triangles, which means that this distance right here is three feet. Okay, and then finally we are told that the trough is filled to a height of one foot with water. And so if this is the height of three feet, then let's say that this height right here is one foot, and so our water level will look something like this. If I try to draw that here, and then I'll shade that in. This is where the water is in our tank. And we wanna calculate the work required to pump this water out of the trough through the top. Okay, so now we have a picture that represents everything that we were given in our problem. Now we just have to set up our definite integral to calculate the work. And we're gonna use the same work formula that we used in our previous example of a pumping problem. We know that the work is equal to the weight density of the liquid 
which in this case is water, times the integral from A to B of the cross-sectional area of a slice of water times delta x, or the distance or displacement that the water needs to travel to be pumped out of the tank, times dx, the height of one of the slices. And so once again, we're working with US units, right? We have feet in our problem. And then we're also working with water here. And so the weight density in this case is going to be 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. That is the weight density of water in the US system. And so then we'll multiply that by the integral and we will come back to the bounds of integration at the end, but let's look at the cross-sectional area of a slice of water in the tank. In this case, if we're going to look at a slice, it's going to be a thin rectangular prism. And so we wanna figure out the area of this rectangle in our trough, okay? So the cross-sectional area will be equal to a length times a width. Now the length of our cross-section is not going to change. That's going to stay the same no matter where in the tank we are because the length of the trough is always 15 feet. That's not going to change. So this is at least going to be equal to 15 times the width, but the width in this case is going to change. Notice that the width of our cross section depends on the distance between the sides of the isosceles triangle. And so down here, that is a smaller distance than it is up here. And so we need to find a way to represent that distance with a variable. And so the way we're going to do that is by using similar triangles. But before we do that, I did forget to label that we are looking at a slice of water that measures a distance of X from the bottom of the trough or from the bottom of the tank. Okay, and so in order to figure out what that width will be, we will have to use two similar triangles. One of those triangles is going to be the end of our trough so I'll draw that one first. This is one of our triangles, and the height of that triangle is three, and the width across the top is four. And then the triangle that would be formed by a slice of water with a height of x and an unknown width would be this triangle. It has a height of x, the distance from that slice to the bottom of the tank, and an unknown width, w. Right, so that W is the distance between the sides of the isosceles triangle at a particular value of X where we drew our slice. That is a distance of X from the bottom of the tank. Okay, and so these triangles are similar. And so we can write a ratio to relate their measurements. And so we can say that four is to three as W is to X, right? The width is to the height as the width is to the height. And so I'll do that up here. We're gonna have four is to three as w is to x. And now we can solve for the width by multiplying both sides by x, and that will tell us that the width is equal to 4 thirds times x. Okay, so no matter where we choose a slice of water within this tank, the width of that slice, this distance between the sides of the triangle, is 4 thirds times x, where x is the distance from the bottom of the tank. And so we can plug that width into our cross-sectional area formula and have 15 times four divided by three times x. Okay, and so we can simplify this. 15 times four is 60. So this is equal to 60 divided by three times x and 60 divided by three is 20. And so this is equal to 20 x. 20 x represents the cross-sectional area of a slice of water in this tank where those slices are rectangular, okay? And so we can plug that into our definite integral. The cross-sectional area is 20 times x. And then if I clean up my work, let's determine the displacement or the distance that the water needs to travel to be pumped. And so if the slice of water that we're looking at is a distance of x from the bottom, then the distance that it needs to pump will be the total height of the tank minus that value of x, right? So if the whole thing is three feet tall and we're choosing a slice that is x feet tall, then that distance from the height to that value of x will be three minus x. We subtract that value of x to find what this value would be. And so if we go back to our definite integral, delta x is equal to three minus x, and that will be multiplied by dx. All right, and so then the only other thing that we need to set up here are the bounds of integration. And those will represent the range of values for which we can pick a slice of water in our tank. And so the water in the tank is filled to a height of one foot, right? That's what this measurement is right here. And so we can choose a value of X between zero feet 
and 1 feet for the water, and so our bounds of integration will be from 0 to 1. Okay, and so now we have successfully set up our definite integral to represent the work done by pumping the water out of this trough. And so we don't need this picture anymore. We can now focus on solving this definite integral. And so the first thing I'll do is simplify a little bit. We can pull this constant of 20 to the outside. So the work will be equal to 62.4 times 20, which is equal to 1,248. And that will be multiplied by the integral from zero to one. And then we can distribute this x through this quantity. So we will have three x minus x squared. All right, and so that will be multiplied by dx. And so now we can integrate each of these terms by using the power rule of integration, and then we'll be able to solve for the work in this problem. So this will be equal to 1,248 times three x squared divided by two minus x cubed divided by three evaluated from zero to one. Right, so for each of these terms, we added one to the exponent and then divided by that new exponent. So now all we have to do is evaluate this expression at one and subtract the evaluation at zero. But once again, note that plugging zero into x here is just going to produce zero for that entire expression. Zero squared times three is zero divided by two, still zero, minus zero cubed divided by three is also still zero. So we just need to plug in one this will be equal to 1,248 times three times one squared divided by two minus one cubed divided by three, and then we can write minus zero if we want to. Then if we simplify, this is equal to 1,248 times three halves minus one third. And three halves minus one third will be equal to seven sixths. So this is equal to 1,248 times seven sixths which is equal to 1,456. And so that is the work done by pumping the water out of the trough, but we still need our units of work, which in this case will be foot pounds since we are working with feet and the weight density of water was measured in pounds per cubic foot. So our units are foot pounds. And so 1,456 foot pounds is the work required to pump all the water over the top of the trough in this problem. Okay, and so with that, that was the end of this example, and this was the last example for this video. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments, but if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.